Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this new episode of the Rose and Rubini podcast, Making Sense of This World. As always, my name is Manas Chavla, and I'm joined by Brunella Rosa, CEO and Head of Research. Uh, this week, we're discussing the biggest uh, political event uh, of the last couple of days that's very much shocked the world, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson's resignation, uh, which I had the privilege of seeing live as I was in front of 10 Downing when he was making that speech. Um, it's had uh, quite the effect, uh, and to many it came as quite a surprise uh, because there were, you know, uh, many number of things that you could say went wrong uh, during Boris Johnson's time. It was one scandal after the other, and the journalists simply couldn't get enough. But Brunello, um, with this uh, timing in particular, what would you say, metaphorically speaking, is the straw that broke the camel's back? So we know that. Um... Boris Johnson uh, resignation were triggered by uh, the way he uh, handled, so to speak, the uh, sexual misconduct scandal of Pincher and so on. But I think really that was just the occasion that the party found to get rid of him. Um, the party, parties. Um, opinion on Johnson has changed quite some time ago. Uh, they were fed up by the scandals, of course, the, the cost of the restructuring of the apartment, the fines due to the parties in Downing Street, and I can name 10 other scandals. Reality is no prime minister, especially no one like Boris Johnson, is Teflon-like, like Trump. I mean, it seems like everything can, can easily be washed away on people like him. So uh, none of this scandal would ever would have ever triggered um, the hand of his uh, leadership of the Tory party and then of the government um, in itself. Clearly, there were other more profound political reasons. Um, and I would say he managed to survive the handling of the pandemic because uh, the beginning, as we all know, was quite disastrous. But then the vaccination program, the speed of it and, and the success of it uh, made it, uh, uh, you know, g gave him a lifeline, so to speak, for a little bit longer. Uh, but the economy and other institutional issues are now coming back with a vengeance in terms of themes. Economy, we all know, the UK, like every other economy, is, is headed for a recession and um, un unemployment is low, but inflation is very high and there are strikes almost every other day. And this is something the population clearly doesn't like. And then there's the handling of the Northern Ireland Protocol with the government who wants to repeal the, uh, uh, the, the agreement made with the EU and that risk reopening the entire Brexit uh, uh, story from another angle. Uh, that is clearly too much for a conservative party. So they found the occasion. It could be this one, could it be another one? Uh, these somehow went through the resignation of Rishi Sunak and uh, 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 Javid effectively uh, meant that two heavyweights in government didn't have confidence in their prime minister anymore. Once they resigned, the avalanche of resignation uh, on the following days was just the um, uh, uh, natural consequences of that. Right. And I suppose a question on everyone's minds when they heard this news because of how abruptly it broke is, you know, this happened, but, but what's next? Uh, and certainly, you know, someone has to fill in the office in 10 Downing uh, and the Conservative Party has very much already started uh, the process of figuring out who that next someone's going to be. In fact, the candidates themselves have probably been thinking about this for a while uh, as, you know, the, the sort of uh, departure of Boris Johnson uh, from sort of a more medium to long term perspective, we know was coming at some point. In fact, Rishi Sunak's uh, domain uh, for his uh, candidacy was made six months ago, his website. Uh, so it, it seems like uh, lots will happen uh, this week, particularly tomorrow. Uh, and the Conservative Party is going to try to narrow down to two candidates in particular. Um, would you have any uh, insight onto you know, who you think those two candidates might be and why? 
So clearly there are lots of people on the list. Rishi Sunak, that you mentioned, is, is the number one candidate to some extent is working on his candidacy, as you said, as you said for some time. Uh, Sajid Javid uh, kind of smartly, I think, decide to join forces with Jeremy Hunt. Jeremy Hunt is the one that lost uh, his, um, the previous leadership contest exactly against Boris Johnson. The two of them have quite a chance. But other candidates clearly are Vistras, who um, has been named many times as a potential successor. Uh, and um, there are other minor candidates, perhaps not even worth discussing, Maybe the one that it's just a bit of a PC that has decided not to run is Ben Wallace, who apparently was one of the most loved by the party base, but um, for a number of reasons, he's decided not to uh, run. We'll see who's going to win the contest. Um, there are plenty of candidates, and uh, some of them, I think, also have the qualifications to be prime minister. And, potentially good prime ministers. And, you know, as we sort of revisit the sort of Boris Johnson era, um, I think some people have already started writing the history books in terms of how he'll be remembered uh, as a prime minister. What, what's your take on this? Because obviously there's so many scandals that, uh, you know, characterize his time in office. What do you think he'll be remembered for? Well, I, I would not discuss about the scandals i think they will be fast forgotten instead there are important legacy issues that would be uh, remaining on the table um, boris johnson leaves a country deeply divided uh, politically for sure the polarization that he brought will remain in place for some time and most importantly it leaves the country geographically divided i mentioned before the issues of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which could potentially lead to a referendum to the unification of Ireland, the, I the Isle of Ireland in coming years, most likely after the end of the, of, uh, the current monarch, so to speak. Um, and the second one is, of course, the Scottish independence uh, story which will probably uh, come back to the table, has already done that so, but uh, will do so more in, in coming years. So literally the risk is that after Boris Johnson's premiership um, and uh, his fractured Brexit approach, uh, we would move from having instead of a Global Britain has the Brexiteers were promising a sort of Little England, uh, in, you know, is a much smaller territory surrounded by independent uh, states and, of course, the EU bloc. And it seems like, you know, although it is a very sort of early stages in the, in the next sort of leadership bid, it seems like all the candidates, if they were to distinguish themselves, um, from each other, it's been on this one axis of tax cuts, you know, and which sort of makes sense if you sort of take into account the cost of living crisis and you think about how the Conservative Party itself generally tends to vote and, you know, the base prefers, so to speak. Um, but, you know, with the sort of overwhelming influence on, on you know, the, the role that tax cuts will play and uh, how people define themselves on this, what are the other issue areas uh, that you think might be, you know, sort of being left behind uh, for electoral concerns that we're not talking about, but will define the next uh, prime minister's time in office? Well, as I said, um, there are, um, I would say the key issue to solve is, is um, making Brexit work for the UK. For the time being, the effects of Brexit have been masked by the pandemic, but this is not going to be the case forever. Um, and the UK has not yet found a, a Brexit model that works for the country. There's a dearth of uh, workers in, in a number of key uh, uh, positions in hospitality, in, uh, in the NHS, and in other um, essential services. And this is because the visa program clearly doesn't work as much as it was supposed to. Um, 
then of course the new prime minister needs to establish a less fractured relationship with the um, uh, with the EU. I mean, the modus operandi of this government has been very confrontational. The next prime minister needs to have a much less confrontational approach, re-establish a good working relationship with the EU. Clearly, they need to continue on trying to build this international relationship, revitalize the Commonwealth, whatever the Brexit is a remind for uh, a post-Brexit Britain. But the reality is that the, the most important trading partner of the UK remains the EU, and so not having a good relationship with the EU doesn't really uh, work. And um, if the next prime minister doesn't do that, the real risk is that um, the UK will lose its influence on the global stage. What a decisive time in, in British politics. Um, and it's one that we'll probably say this but until we break for summer recess. Uh, so your, you know, your thoughts and insights as always, super, super valuable, particularly at this time. Thank you so much for your time, Bruno. Thank you very much until next time.